Thank you for sticking around. Um, really looking forward to this session on endoscopy in the future. Uh, a wise man once said that uh, the future is certain, it's the past that keeps changing. Um, I'm glad that uh, we can welcome some uh, intelligence into the room, uh, even if it's just artificial <laughs> intelligence uh, in the form of uh, Gustavo Cañero, um, and really looking forward to your talk. All so. right, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I know the title was Artificial Intelligence in, uh, I don't remember the title, but it was Artificial Intelligence and it's, uh, it's really about machine learning and that's what I put here. And so um, it, the talk will be about machine learning and then uh, just kind of a rough introduction, introduction to the field, we do two things. One is medical image computing, which is my main field of research. And then there's computer-assisted intervention, which is something that I, um, I'm entering right now. And one of the reasons is Raj here that uh, you know, I'm getting into the field of computer-assisted intervention. And then when people talk about uh, machine learning, medical imaging, what uh, you probably should have in mind is that there are actually two things, medical image computing, computer-assisted intervention. And that's actually the title of our main conference, which is MIKAI, which is just joining these two words, MIK and KAI. All right. Um, yeah. So focusing on computer system intervention. First, just an introdu introduction of who I am. So I'm a professor in computer science at here, you know, University of Adelaide. I just become an ARC Future Fellow, which means that I'll have a lot more time in my hands to do research. Uh, Chief Investigator of the Australian Center for Robotic Vision and Chief Investigator for a couple of discovery projects. These are ARC, ARC discovery projects. My PhD is from Toronto. And then I did a bunch of postdocs at UCSD, UBC, uh, IST, Lisbon. And then I worked at Siemens Corporate Research, uh, which now is called Siemens Health in Year. So uh, that's where I get my main experience in medical imaging at, at St. Princeton. And currently, my group has about 13 PhD students, a couple of masters and honors, and two postdocs. Main research topics are computer vision, medical image analysis, machine learning. And yeah, so these are collaborations that I have right now. And yeah, so I also organized uh, the first workshop in medical image analysis in the main conference, uh, which is Mikai, uh, between the years 15 and 18. But then I stopped from last year because right now, uh, if you look at the papers that we have in medical image, they are all about deep learning. So it doesn't make sense to have a workshop in deep learning anymore. Um, okay, so starting from the beginning, um, I put this kind of Socratic type of question here, what is machine learning? Uh, and mostly because when I get this question, well, I actually got this question uh, from a reporter and I failed miserably answering it, you know, just giving examples of uh, what machine, le machine learning is. So I decided to put like the kind of official uh, definition of what machine learning is. So scientific study of algorithms and uh, statistical models to perform a specific task without using explicit instructions and relying on patterns and inference instead. So that's what I'm gonna try to talk about today. I mean, the first part of the talk will be uh, trying to define what machine learning is, and um, then I will present some works that I have with Raj, and also in another computer assisted intervention project that I have. Okay, so um, just to get started, so I, I want to give some sort of historical perspective of machine learning, how it's kind of dominating the whole field and how it's kind of, you know, getting the attention from a lot of people, not only within computer science, but now outside computer science. Uh, so suppose <laughs> uh, Raj comes to me about 40 years ago and then he says, well, you know, I want to classify, uh, you know, this polyp images into five different classes and these are the classes that I have. And uh, then he'll probably give me a handful of images. You know, remember that's 40 years ago. He was not going to give more than 10 or 20 images. And then I would have my PC with, I don't know, eight megabytes or something like this. So it was a really tough time for computer science and for medical imaging. So, uh, you know, it's just very hard to do anything that would work reasonably well with this kind of image and this kind of setup. And, you know, 40 years ago, that's how we did things. So you have an image here, and then what you do is you start designing a lot of 
filters to extract features from the image. And this design is basically uh, based on uh, my discussion with the doctors. Um, and the doctor would tell, well, I look at this particular type of texture, I look at this particular type of borders and the shape and that and that. And then I would try to somehow use a lot of uh, filters to extract this information. And then I would produce a lot of different features. Um, so, you know, radiomics, for example, that's what uh, it's, you know, kind of bread and butter for radiomics. And then after I have that, I have a, this bunch of features. And they will basically, uh, they can be uh, summarized with numbers. And then what I do is, you know, if feature one is bigger than 0.9, then classify as class one. And then if it's feature two is less than minus three, classify as class two oh, and so on, right? So you just code everything. Everything's coded uh, just based on these discussions with the doctors and, you know, everything's manual. Um, so by the way, uh, when I finish my, my degree, I mean, I'm telling this because I know, uh, you know, people are afraid of machine learning, that they're going to take their jobs. That's, I don't support that. I think that's just not true. When I finished my PhD, my PhD entirely was on the, the design of uh, filters. And, you know, I survived, you know, you, you know, I had to adapt, of course, but, you know, this is something that uh, is going to happen and people will have to adapt. But so here's, you know, the two steps manually designed. And if you look at this, you have these two opportunities, right? The design of the filters and the design of the classifiers. Uh, so this, you know, two separate steps. And that's uh, when machine learn learning entered the picture. Uh, first, they will replace the classifier. Uh, and that happened probably around the 1990, 1990 to 2010. And that's when you start seeing things like boosting and SVMs and decision trees and all these things. So um, the features were still designed by hand, but the classifiers now would take these features and just learn uh, based on the annotations that people give to, uh, to the classifier. So that's the first stage. But then, um, in, you know, from 2010, around that time, uh, deep learning came into a working condition uh, because before deep learning was not really working. So deep learning was actually developed in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. Uh, but uh, people didn't have the computers, people didn't have the data to do this. And a lot of people in the uh, research community tried to make it work, they couldn't. Um, and then just it was kind of fading out, you know, the thing was just being forgotten until around 2011, uh, Jeff Hinton from Toronto uh, just, you know, he got this opportunity of uh, trying to put a GPU to be trained and use a very large data set and the thing just, you know, produced the results that are a lot better than what we had before. Uh, that's kind of the history behind uh, the whole deep learning. So, you know, the two opportunities are this, uh, replacing the fire and replacing the future. So deep learning actually does the two things at the same time. Okay, so, um, yeah, so bear with me with the, the mathematics. I try to make it uh, very simple, uh, but uh, I will try to kind of explain the stages of deep learning, okay? And before I get to the deep learning part, I will start with a very simple two-stage feature design and classifier design that you need to kind of know to understand the whole thing. So um, first, let's, uh, you know, you have an image, and the goal is to extract features from the image and then classify these features into a particular class. But here, let's start with regression, because regression and classification, they are basically the same problem, but regression will be in a continuous domain and classification will be in a discrete domain. So starting with the regression, our goal is to take the image and, for example, localize the position of the polyp. So this is this big cross here, the middle, which indicates the position. And then what you're going to do first is to extract features from the image, so that's this phi um, variable here. Image is, you can imagine, just a big vector with numbers that is extracted from this image. And it has height and weight uh, and width. And this theta f represents the parameter of your feature extractor model. I will explain this later, what, what that means. But so let's say you take the image, you apply some function that's parameterized by theta f, and then you produce this feature uh, phi. And after you've done that, 
you'll take your feature phi and you apply for the second uh, for uh, apply the second uh, uh, regression function that's parameterized by theta r, and then you produce this x and y position of your polyp. So then you have these two stages: feature uh, uh, extraction and then feature classification. So these are exactly the two stages that you saw before. But now, instead of designing them manually, what, you, what you're going to try to do is design uh, them based only on the data set. So it's all based on uh, the, uh, the annotations that you have. OK. First thing you need to do is assume that you have a model for your function. So let's assume a very simple model, which is actually exactly what you have in deep learning. Um, which is a linear model, which means that you will take the, your image, remember it's a big vector, and then you multiply by a value, uh, uh, in this case a slope, the slope of the line, plus b, which is the intersect of the line. Uh, and this will produce your feature. So, uh, you know, imagine that I only take the first pixel of the image, I know that's not very realistic, but it just simplifies the whole discussion. But in fact, what you have is a big vector being multiplied by a big matrix. But here, let's assume there's just one point, one pixel multiplied by one single slope. And now, the parameters of your function will be A and B, which are the slope and the intersect of your line. And that's all you need to produce this feature phi. So now, what you have is you have an image, and then you apply this feature, uh, this, uh, this function that gets the image and has the parameter produced phi. And that's the point in this feature space where you have the image and phi. And then for the classifier, or for the regressor in this case, you take a phi in this other space. And here is the position x, for example, of, your, um, uh, of the polyp. And this position x is actually a position in the image. And that's what you want to learn. You want to learn this feature extractor and this regressor. There's just things that you want to learn. Now, this is how you learn these things. Um, so again, you have now the function that uh, extracts the features and the function that regresses the position. And you have now a training set. So the training set will be images and the positions of the polyps, right? So this blue, red, uh, yellow, and uh, uh, purple will be just the positions of a polyp. And now uh, this, each one of these images will be kind of distributed in this space of the feature extractor and the space of the regressor. So remember that uh, the image here should be fixed, right? Because this, this is just uh, an input. And the output x is also fixed because that's the output. But the way these this points move in terms of uh, the variable phi can change in any way. Um, and that's exactly how you train this thing. So you want to uh, take these points and somehow minimize uh, the distance between the points and the line that we represent that particular function in the feature space and in the regressor space. And then what you do is you will move phi, uh, the, the value for phi for each one of these points, such that the line becomes aligned with all the points. And you know you see these little um, uh, arrows here. These are these are the errors that you want to minimize. And once you minimize, and then you know these are uh, the stochastic gradient descent function that we minimize. So this is an algorithm. It's yeah. So that's too much to explain in 30 minutes. But what the, what it does in the end is this. So it just aligns these points in this line, both in the feature space and the regressor space. And now what you do is you have uh, a function that extracts features and that uh, regresses the position. So that's exactly how machine learning works in a, in a nutshell, right, in, in 10 minutes. Um, everything else you see is just kind of sophisticated algorithms and so on, but you know, the gist of, uh, of machine learning methods is this. Now, once you train this, you just throw away all these points. You don't care about them anymore. You already uh, learned them. So you only care now about your model. So now you take your model. And let's say you have a test image that you haven't seen before. So this test image will have this value here for image. Then it will use this model here to produce a value for phi. And then it takes this value for phi and then produces a value for x. And that's your position. Um, 
So you see that I threw away everything about the training set. Now I only use the models that I learned, and that's it. So that's all I need. So for classification, it's basically the same. Um, you also have a linear function for your classifier. And, uh, but now you have five classes in this example. And what do you have to do for classification? Because you know, uh, classification, you only care if the class is present or not, So which means 0 or plus 1. Plus 1 meaning uh, that the class is present. Then what you need to do is you take this linear function here that you learn, and you pass that through a what is called an activation function. The activation function, what it does is it squashes the function between the values of 0 and 1. So you know you come from here to there. And that's your classifier. So now, uh, values for phi that are below this threshold will be classified as negative, and phi uh, uh, higher than these values will be classified as positive. And then you can do that for class 1, and then class 2, O, and so on. So it's the same story. But that, that's what I said, right? Regression and classification, they're about the same problem. You just for classification, you just need to kind of squash the functions. Right, so this is um, what is called a neural net. Okay, so you have this uh, feature extractor and the classifier. But now, why do I call these things deep learning? When, when I should call it deep learning? So here is the trick. Um, so remember that I, I had this function, right? So f of uh, image and theta f. So that's the extractor. So the deep learning business is just about uh, uh, take this function and apply another function over the result of this, and then apply another function, and then apply another function, and another function. So what it does is it starts to move away from the line that you learned to much more complicated things like this. So now you can learn very complicated structures, both in the feature space and the classification space. So the classifier also has the same kind of structure so you can just go up and down, up and down, up and down. So you're going to have different lines combining them in different <laughs> ways. Right. So that's deep learning from what, what we had before. Um, knowing exactly the transition between uh, what is a feature extractor and what is a classifier becomes complicated because, you know, in the end, what you, what you will have is just this composition of functions. So is the classifier the last layer, the, the two last layers, and so on? It's, it's very complicated to actually tell exactly you know, where classifier uh, starts and where the feature extractor ends. OK, so every time uh, you ask a machine learning uh, scientist you know, how, much, uh, you know, how many annotated, annotated data points you need, he, will always say, he or she will always say the same thing. Uh, we need as many as you can give me, because um, these models, they can have around millions of parameters. So the line that you see there, so imagine that with, you know, like a thousand for each layer. So that's roughly what you have. And then you have, you know, about a hundred layers like this. And that's a lot of parameters. And the trouble is if you have a lot of parameters and very few points to fit this model, uh, you can get a very crazy function like this. So, you know, it just, it just keeps going to very, you know, interesting. You can do interesting things, but that are completely not realistic. And uh, the same story with the classifier. So if you have many parameters, not many annotated points, you start getting very crazy uh, shapes here too. And this is called overfitting. Um, and that always happens when you have very small training sets, very large models. And the idea here is to uh, regularize training. So, and then there's a lot of techniques uh, to regularize it. You know, you can reduce the model complexity and so on and so forth. And that's how you get. So, once you are at this stage, and then you check uh, how you're uh, working in your training set, that means you're working well. But of course, if you regularize too much, um, then you start not fitting the uh, the points again. So, you know, it's it's kind of uh, nowadays it's even a, a kind of an art to know when you're overfitting or when you're over-regularizing. So you know, uh, getting the right point is always tricky. Uh, and that a lot of the, not of the research, but a lot of the uh, uh, work that people do in machine learning is actually trying to find this good point. OK, so that's all I have for uh, machine learning. So I will go and show some examples I have for colonoscopy and the, the project that I've been, I've been developing with Raj. Um, our final goal 
is to have a system that can detect, localize, and predict the histology of neoplastic colorectal lesions. So that's our final goal. I mean, it's hopefully soon. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've been working together with clinicians and so on. So, um, and the goal is for the system to uh, uh, work during the exam as, as a, a helper, right? Not, not as something that will tell exactly what's going on, but as a helper, you know, just calling the attention of the doctor continuously about things that are, uh, are, are appearing in the video, and then maybe even classifying things and detecting things. So it's not to replace doctors, so that's an important thing. So what we have done so far, we have a, a system that can classify polyps. It's, it's, uh, it's a still a prototype, you know, we still need to work on it, but it's doing a, a, reasonably, a reasonably good job. Uh, we do have a system that can calibrate the classification and predict uncertainty, so that's good for model interpretability. Um, we have a system that can localize and classify polyps at the same time, not only classification that you had here, and then uh, a system that can detect frames that contains polyps. So just moving in stages, so this is the system that can classify uh, polyps, and what we have here is a data set with about a thousand uh, annotated images in these five classes. Uh, so we have a very imbalanced annotation. Um, I think classes 2, 0, and 2 have many, many more annotations than the other three classes. And that's, that's always a problem for machine learning systems because once you have a class that dominates, uh, the, the model will try to get that class uh, right more often than the other ones because it has more samples. And we have uh, uh, balding box annotations from uh, a doctor who just annotated each one of these polyps. So, you know, the input of our system is actually a bounding box, like an image like this, with the polyp already cropped. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a, an easier problem to solve. So the result we got um, is, a, is about that. So this is a confusion matrix, which means that this is the true label on the, uh, this vertical direction, and the horizontal direction is the predicted label by the system. As you can see, classes 2 and 2.0, uh, it does a reasonably good job at the prediction for all the other ones. It's slightly worse, and then you can actually see how the system gets confused, like, you know, between classes 1 and 2.0, for example. So that's why you see, like, this uh, large value for 2.0, and the true label is, in this case, 1. And we also uh, had the result between just benign and neoplastic, and in this case, we can get you know, really, really good results. The accuracy from this confusion matrix is about 64%, so just the average of all these values. Okay, so classification, calibration, and uncertainty. Uh, so that's something that is very important, and in order to work well with doctors, we need that. So uh, deep learning, they tend to be uh, overconfident about a result. So when they say, they either say, you know, it's 0% chance or 100% chance. So they, they are never, they very rarely give a result that is in between. And that's not helpful because, you know, if the system says, you know, there's a 100% chance that this polyp is class one, uh, I want the system to be right 100%, right? Or close to it. Uh, and that never happens. So you need to classify your model if you want that to happen. And the, uh, and the calibration will, will do something like this. So if the classifier says it's 60% class one, if you take all the images that are being classified as 60%, 60% of the time it will be correct. Um, so that's the whole point of calibrating the, uh, the, the model. And then there is also the uncertainty. So the uncertainty is uh, how certain the system is about the classification. So, um, you know, it, it can classify 60% but be very uncertain or classify 60% and be very certain. And the interesting thing is that when you put these two things together, you can actually have something like this, uh, where the system can be uh, very confident and have very low uncertainty about an, uh, an outcome, and then the doctor will be more willing to accept. Or the system can be uh, very high, can have very high uncertainty and very high confidence, or very low uncertainty and, and low confidence, and then doctor would be would have to be cautious about the result and then the system can be very can have very high uncertainty and very low confidence and then a doctor would probably reject the result so it gives the doctor a chance to look at the result look at the confidence look at the uncertainty and say okay you know I will accept uh, be cautious or reject um, 
These things will happen, uh, will help to improve the interpret interpretability of the results and also uh, we can use this to uh, improve the accuracy. Simply reject all the test images that uh, the system says reject. And so that's what I did here. So what you see is all the, uh, the percentage of test samples without any rejection in terms of uncertainty and calibration. And as I start rejecting samples that have high uncertainty and low confidence, you see that the accuracy starts to grow. So, uh, you know, you're rejecting samples, oops, sorry, you're rejecting samples and uh, accuracy starts to go up. Um, and that's exactly what we want to see, right? We want to see the system um, kind of being more confident and less, uncertainty, uh, and less uncertain about the samples that they actually uh, gets, it, uh, gets the correct answer. Um, all right, so this is uh, uh, another system that we have now. Remember that the system that I had before, I had to give a cropped image of the polyp. And in this system, I no longer need to do that. I give just the whole image, and then the system will actually detect the bounding box of the polyp and also uh, classify the polyp. So that's kind of the first stage towards a fully automated system. Um, the interesting thing about this paper here is that uh, the system can do these two things, these two stages at the same time, and it was one of the first methods to do that. So uh, previously, most of the methods would do that separately. It would first have a detection system and then a classification system. And this system here does two at the same time. And the main thing is that this can be done in 0.06 seconds per image, which is very important for a real-time uh, system. So here are some results. So uh, this is a challenge in uh, Mikai for colonoscopy. This is just detection. So the detection of the system for this uh, challenge was almost perfect, and we are top one or top two um, in, in the table of results. And in regis uh, images, we are doing really well as well. So the classification is about the same as we had with the system that classifies the polyp uh, with the cropped images. Uh, but here, remember that we are taking the whole image, so it's you know, trying to detect and classify the polyp at the same time. Okay, so it's the, this is the, uh, one of the systems that we developed uh, last year and beginning of this year um, is to uh, detect frames that contain polyp. The interesting thing about this system is that we do that by looking at the videos that of uh, patients who don't have polyps. So our detection of polyps is actually an outlier detection system. So the whole, whole idea is this. So you take, uh, you, you build a system that is able to reconstruct uh, images of, from colonoscopy, but because you only give images of patients who don't have polyps, you can only reconstruct images of patients who don't have polyps. So, and once you give an image of a patient who have a polyp, it will reconstruct but almost erase the polyp. And when we compute the difference between the, the original image and the reconstructed image, we get a very high values for images that contain polyps and low values for images that don't contain polyps, uh, which allows us to detect images with polyps. So here is a video of the system running. I mean, I know that you see this thing kind of uh, flashing normal and abnormal, but usually what you have to see is, uh, you know, most of the frames with showing a polyp, it has to show abnormal, and most of the frames that uh, are normal should be normal, but you know, it's okay to flash abnormal and normal because we haven't post-processed anything here. It's just uh, you know, frame by frame processing. And once we do the post-processing, you see that these results will become a lot more stable. But you know, that's the, the beginning. And, um, and comparing our system with other systems that do similar things in the field, and this is talking about you know, machine learning, computer vision methods that do similar stuff, we are you know, well ahead. So you know, uh, we have a student who is working on this, it's just amazing, he's doing a really, really good job. Right, and one last work that is also about intervention um, is a project that I'm working with people from QT, um, and it's on uh, robotic uh, arthroscopy. And our goal is to have this arthroscope that will be in the knee. And the goal is to uh, get the depth that you see in front of the arthroscope and also the semantic segmentation. In this case, what you see in red is femur, 
in yellow tibia, ACL in blue, we don't see here, but it will show, and meniscus in green. So, um, and then you see the arthroscope moving, and so the depth image, when you see yellowish, that means far away from the camera. When you see purple, that's very close to the camera. And, you know, using these two things now, what we're trying to do is to kind of reconstruct the whole knee using this semantic segmentation. And that's important because uh, doctors, particularly unexperienced doctors, when they do arthroscopy, they need to know what is in front of the camera, and sometimes they may get lost. And a system like this would help doctors to kind of realize where they are and then just, you know, kind of localize, uh, you know, the whole arthroscope. Okay, so uh, to conclude the talk, um, so ideal scenario for machine learning. So you're, you're, if you're thinking of using machine learning for something, uh, here are kind of tips, right? So if you have a data set that is large, and if it, a data set that is clean in the sense that the images are clean, the annotations are reliable, and of course, if humans can do a good job in annotating the images, or maybe you have annotations from histology, which is even better, then that's a good candidate uh, for using a machine learning system. Of course, we have a lot of challenges ahead, and uh, that's part of the work I'm doing right now as a you know, future fellow. One is dealing with noisy data sets. You know, clean data sets are awesome, uh, but they are usually small, and we, you know the problem with small data sets, it overfits. Noisy data sets are everywhere. They are you know, gigantic, and we can take them and try to work with them. But the problem is that they are noisy, both in terms of the input images. They can contain even images of that stuff that you don't expect, and also the annotations may be noisy. Um, dealing with small and highly unbalanced data sets, so that's another issue. Uh, that we, we've been working with, um, explanation of results, and basically you have to answer the questions, why did the system make this classification? Um, another thing that I'm studying right now is can we use, can we actually classify and detect stuff that humans can't? So for example, if I, if I take a chest CT of a patient, and I know that patient will die in five years, can I tell why that patient will die in five years? Or can I at least predict if the patient will die in five years? And, um, and that's one of the major things that is being discussed right now, is how can machine learn, learning change the behavior of clinicians? Uh, and that's, of course, you know, there's, you, I'm sure you're aware of this, but there's one million discussions, papers coming out on how we can do this. So uh, to finish, uh, just acknowledgments of my collaborators and uh, the uh, places that fund my research. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yep. uh, are there any questions for Gustavo? Or is everyone feeling as intellectually inadequate as I am? <laughs> Oh. Yeah, Jonathan. Well, just a, a sort of question and a comment. So, I've got a son who's doing advanced computer science at Lake Uni and wants to do some AI work, and uh, he's already uh, uh, beyond me in terms of uh, I, I find him hard to understand over dinner and what he's saying, but but it's gratifying to know that there are very, very smart people behind these these machines that can that can teach us things about ourselves and our patients and, and moving forward. And I was very excited to see some of the uh, systems last year at AGW where they're picking up these polyps uh, quickly. So how, how long do you think it will take before these kind of things get into routine clinical practice with, with people like us? Yeah, that's, that's a dangerous question to answer. Um, five years? <laughs> five years, yeah. Five to, uh, well, I mean, five to ten years, I think. But it will come slowly, okay? So I think it will come in stages. Um, and I, I think probably the major candidates are the screening processes, and that uh, colonoscopy is a major one. And breast screening is another major one. I think these two will probably be the first ones to start, you know, coming up. I think uh, breast screening is actually ahead. They they have a lot more stuff going on. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but I think uh, it's it's but probably a bit easier to get images and to collaborate. Um, but I think this one's probably right there. And you know, I think very soon, 
I would say five years, but it's always dangerous. Yeah. It's exciting because it means that for us, you know, our our detection rates and the safety of the procedures that we do can really be improved, and yes. you know, we yeah. can we can uh, uh, we can look forward to that, and so uh, yeah, so it can only enhance what we do. So I think it's just very exciting. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you very much for, yeah. for that. Uh, it was fascinating to uh, to listen to. It, probably just more a comment rather than a, a question. Really, I, I think this could really help our practice in the future. But there's still that very important human interface there. And, and you know, if if the uh, colonoscopist is not thorough, if the bowel prep is poor, you know, if we're not examining behind all the folds, doesn't matter what technology you've got, we, we're still going just the lesions so it, it you know perhaps there's still going to be a job for us in the future despite your work <laughs> uh, Raj oh sorry go on Raj. Professor Hi. okay uh, well I was impressed by your well if I could uh, totally understand the technical part of it uh, and one thing I learned is the uh, the two keywords classifier regressor mm -hmm. and machine learning um, okay, one comment is that uh, your last statement, changing human behavior, I truly believe that human, human behavior may be changed with this uh, AI ability and uh, with the ability of the machine to detect lesion, I, I fear that over a period of time, long period of time, perhaps the detection capability of endoscopy may drop over time. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know, this is just my understanding, just my uh, gut feeling. So the detection of uh, endoscopy by, by humans? Yeah, endoscopy may just pull out the scope, hoping that the machine will then detect the lesion. Um, then I, I, this, you know, of course, they will do maneuvers to increase the, uh, like, like a J uh, in the sequence so the machine can look at it. But they perhaps will not put an effort to really look hard for the lesions. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Um, you know, there is always a danger, right? So if the system works really well. Uh, there is a danger that colonoscopists can rely too much on it, and that's really dangerous. But um, I think the system, in the way I see it, at least in the first stage, is they will, it will detect the very easy cases, right? Uh, not the hard cases. So the hard cases will be left for the doctor. And in stages, we will get there. But uh, it's like an autopilot, you know, for planes, you know, they just pilot when, when no, the autopilot comes on when it's just flying, nothing is happening. Once something happens, then the pilot has to take over. I think we'll be roughly the same. Um, very different applications, but I think, uh, you know, at the beginning, that's how I see it. You know, just the easy cases and then little by little harder cases. But hopefully doctors will not rely on it too much. I mean, that's not the point. I think doctors are really important here and they have the final decision. Yeah. Yeah, right. we, still, we still need someone to take off those polyps. So I think the machines still have some way to go. Yes. Um, <laughs> the, the thing, uh, it's quite interesting. Gustavo and I have been uh, collaborating for probably two and a half years now. Um, just yesterday there was a study published uh, recently in, in The Lancet, which we were made aware of, um, of a randomized control study looking at one arm where a colonoscope is uh, screen patients uh, with, I guess, a colonoscopy for polyps and ADR detection rate of 28%. And the other arm where uh, I suppose the same or a different group did the same thing, but they use AI in addition to uh, obviously driving the colonoscope themselves. So the ADR was 34%. Um, yeah, 6% increase. What does it mean? Uh, we don't really know, but um, uh, this is Possibly uh, one of the first RCTs in mm -hmm. uh, screening colonoscopy. So, so the only comment I'd make to that, Raj, is that the uh, the average in Australia is around 40, yeah. 40 plus percent. Um, and, and yeah, so yeah. So, so Charles, that so in Australia we're a bit biased because we are using FIT positive patients and enrolling them into screening programs. So sure. for some other countries, for instance, the States or uh, this study was performed in China, um, uh, patients are enrolled without an FIT test. So they are kind of all comers. I, I think 40% uh, is in all comers. Our FIT um, uh, adenoma detection rate in our institution in FIT positive patients 
approaching 70 percent so between 60 and 70 percent so we then have to work on our national guidelines isn't it it says is it 20 20 percent for yeah. females and 30 for no 25 Other and 15 yeah mm. yeah all right. I suspect you two could argue about that for a long time. <laughs> uh, thank you, Gustavo. Thank um, you very much. We'll move on to our next um, thank you. speaker. So the last talk uh, for the program is from Professor Chu, who's going to uh, give us a talk entitled Third Space. Have we reached the last frontier in interventional endoscopy or is this just the beginning? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I don't have any mathematical model in my presentation uh, or any calculation, but uh, perhaps some kind of speculation. So uh, first space. Uh, first of all, we have to define what is uh, first space for us. Uh, because uh, that was uh, listed um, in a, an article published uh, in the GIE by uh, Moran Kashrab. Um, well, the uh, uh, status is that uh, if the lumen is histologically uh, confirmed at the first space that we know from endoscopy side, peritoneal cavity was a second space, and in the past we were very worried about seeing that second space of perforation. Then the um, intralum intramural space, which is the antisamucosa, could represent the first space. And uh, right now, I think all of you know that we are utilizing this submucosal space to achieve therapeutic. Uh, procedures um, for flexible endoscopy. So this first space is uh, what we are seeing over here. So um, the uh, development of the first space was uh, through um, the research over the NOx. If you remember still in the year 2000, the concept of the natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery. And uh, during the process of research, there's a lot of uh, uh, debate about how we can safely access the peritoneal cavity. Uh, and one of the uh, pioneer development is in fact a submucosal tunnel. And uh, Professor Inoue utilized um, this concept and uh, to approach uh, the uh, muscularis propria and perform the first peroral endoscopic myotomy in the year 2008. And this is now tro almost 12 years after the initial first case report uh, by Professor Inoue. So um, maybe um, you, you probably know about uh, the POEM procedure because uh, there's, you can actually look at it. There's a lot of uh, you know, published article and also the video on um, the YouTube. So if you search POEM, there will be a lot, tons of uh, video. But, uh, I think the concept, it's uh, easily understandable because um, we develop and open up the mucosal entrance uh, is around 10 centimeter approximate to the um, uh, tight uh, GE junction at the uh, low isosceles sphincter. And then I open up around 2 centimeter of uh, mucosal entrance and then develop a submucosal tunnel all the way down to the gastric cardia. Usually for me, it's around 2 uh, centimeter to 3 centimeter below the, um, uh, the uh, uh, GE junction. And then afterwards, I performed uh, the myotomy over the tight. Um, area of the not relaxing low esophageal sphincter. So, okay, I think because of time we have to uh, fast forward. So now you can see um, the tunnel has been developed over the gastric cardia and then we start the uh, myotomy. So for me, it's just an inner circular uh, myotomy, very selective. And uh, as a surgeon, I believe that uh, this is very much similar in the quality of myotomy as compared to the Heller myotomy. Uh, but uh, we are more precise as compared to laparoscopic uh, myotomy because uh, we are seeing the inner circular myotomy uh, fiber by fiber. So it's probably even more precise than Heller. Okay, so we started uh, the uh, poem in the 2010 and now we've experienced more than 300 cases of uh, poem procedure. And uh, recently, I think there are two important randomized control trials. One is uh, 
comparing POEM versus pneumatic dilatation, we are one of the centers led by the uh, Amsterdam group. And in this uh, randomized trial, you can see that uh, for uh, the treatment success, POEM achieved a 92% of a treatment success as compared to 54% in the pneumatic dilatation. And uh, this is a significant difference between the two treatments. And um, also the, uh, another recent uh, publication, the previous one is in JAMA, this one is in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, recently published uh, comparing, it's a multi-center randomized non-inferiority trial comparing POEM versus laparoscopic halomatomy uh, among 221 patients. And uh, again, because of this non-inferiority design, you can see that uh, there is actually no difference between the two uh, groups uh, receiving POEM versus laparoscopic halomatomy in terms of the uh, treatment outcome. Uh, and uh, uh, that's including the ECHO score and also the uh, GI quality of life uh, in this all. And uh, perhaps uh, one of the major uh, problem or question is about uh, reflux uh, after the poem, uh, which uh, was reported to be more significant uh, after poem as compared to a helomatomy. So this is one of the uh, development uh, that may have the future of controlling the reflux. This is uh, again uh, pioneered by Professor Inoue. So after uh, the prone procedure, uh, we'll be able to perform a fundal plication to uh, reduce the reflux. So this is um, what he did after the anterior approach. Uh, he actually go through the peritoneal cavity and uh, pull the uh, anterior surface of the gastric fundus and uh, pull back and uh, uh, fix it, fixing this uh, with a clip and the loop and then pull back uh, to cover the um, myotomy site as illustrated by this picture so that uh, it can have a the anti-reflux uh, uh, mechanism. So to me it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a pioneer, it's a very important uh, procedure but uh, at the present moment we do not have a good uh, understanding of the fixation mechanism and uh, perhaps also uh, we need a longer term uh, follow up and uh, to see whether this is going to work or not. Uh, but then the, the potential of the first phase endoscopy has been extended. So uh, not only are we treating a calasia, but uh, also we are treating some mucosal tumors by this stir or the POET procedure. We are treating gastroparesis by the GPOM. We are treating Sankus diverticulum by the Z poem, and we are treating esophageal diverticulum by the D poem. And I think this this is going to extend. I'm, I'm pretty sure in the future we will have uh, more A B C D E poem. So, um, so why why do we have uh, such a drive towards uh, this some mucosal endoscopy or first phase endoscopy? I think the one of the major reason is because uh, when we are doing minimal invasive surgery through the second space, we still need some skin incision. So uh, although there's a much significantly much less pain as compared to open procedure, there's still some pain. A patient, uh, of course, can have uh, you know earlier recovery as compared to open. But when we compare laparoscopic surgery versus endoscopic or endoluminal surgery, I think uh, endoluminal surgery is even less or even no pain induced for the patient. Uh, and uh, also no incision, which is uh, pretty much attractive for a patient. Uh, and this is uh, one of the uh, side development of the, uh, the from the poem. Then now we have the submucosal tunnel endoscopic resection or the peroral endoscopic tumor resection, and uh, we are targeting at uh, tumor at the esophagus, cardia, antrum, and the lesser curvature. Uh, typically, this technique applied for resection of this tumor by developing a tunnel from the mucosal entrance and tunnel over both sides of the tumor, and then uh, finally leaving a distal pocket for manipulation of the tumor, and then we will dissect at the very end. So these are the instruments that we need. They are all endoscopic instruments that we typically use uh, for ESD. So uh, you can see this is uh, one of the video. Uh, the tumor is in the esophagus. So um, we first develop a mucosal entrance, which is uh, two centimeter proximal to the tumor. 
Uh, we don't do a very long tunnel because it's unnecessary. And uh, also when we retrieve the tumor, finally, it's difficult to retrieve if we have a long tunnel. So just very short two centimeter tunnel. And then uh, we reach the tumor and we dissect uh, around the tumor from both sides. Uh, and after completely mobilizing the tumor, as you can see here, that is the, the uh, esophageal submucosal tumor. Then the, we uh, finally uh, dissect over the base, over the uh, muscle layer, so to completely resect this tumor. So very importantly, we need a distal pocket because uh, the space is really limited. So if we are man manipulating the tumor, sometimes uh, it's very difficult, then we cannot expose and understand um, the base of the tumor so that uh, we couldn't see very clearly uh, when we have completely dissected the tumor. So I think uh, because of time, we need to uh, fast forward a little bit. So here we are still continuing the dissection around the tumor. So this is the, the muscle base, uh, which is the uh, adherent uh, area of uh, uh, the muscarous propria. For esophagus, most of this tumor are lyomalma. So we removed it uh, only because uh, uh, the patient may, may be having some symptom or they do not like uh, to have this tumor inside. So most of the time, we are removing around three to four centimeters of this uh, submucosal tumor. There's some size limitation to this dissection. For example, if it's more than four centimeters in size, it's very difficult to remove it per orally. So we focus on the esophagus uh, gastric cardia, which is also difficult even if we are doing laparoscopic wedge resection at the lesser curvature and also at the uh, antrum. So for greater curvature, a lot of the time we just do a laparoscopic wedge resection, which we can complete it in a very, uh, you know, within 30 minutes. So it's so that is not that difficult. Okay, so finally we re remove the tumor per orally. And then we close the defect by the clip. It's very similar to POEM. So uh, we published this uh, uh, some mucosal tumor resection. And uh, there's some case where we need uh, to convert either to laparoscopic uh, resection or for endoscopic full fragments resection um, because um, the tumor location and also because the size is too big. The average size is 20 mm. Operative time is 90 minutes. And uh, there are also reports from uh, uh, other groups, mainly from China, uh, for this stir technique. The on-block resection rate is a re rate between 80 to 100 um, percent. The uh, common complications include uh, emphysema, pneumothorax, pneumoperitoneum. Um, uh, these are really, really minor to minor complications. Uh, and uh, most of these tumors are either GIST or lyomalma. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, not only are we focusing on the, the tumor resection, but also on the functional disease. For example, in the cricofringes, when you have the Sankus diverticulum, you can do set poem. If Achilles is a poem, diverticulum is D poem, gastroparesis G poem, and even in the rectum for Hirschsprung disease, there are uh, uh, doctors from India doing a per rectal endoscopic myotomy. So this is uh, one of the uh, example of the Sankus. And I think uh, you, you all know that uh, we have the uh, endoscopic septoptomy uh, that we can cut over this septum to uh, uh, treat the sankus. But with the development of the uh, set poem, we are actually developing a submucosal tunnel so that we can reach this uh, end of the ridge and we don't worry about a perforation. So in general concept, uh, that may end up in a more complete uh, septoptomy, but it also depends on expert, of course. And uh, I think this is one of the uh, uh, clinical outcome reports uh, showing a good clinical success of 92%, technical success of 97%. So the deep poem or the uh, submucosal tunnel endoscopic septum division is a similar concept. So just like uh, Sankus, we actually develop a um, submucosal tunnel uh, over the proximal side and if we reach um, the septum, after the uh, development of the submucosal tunnel, we can reach the septum, okay? And then we divide um, over the uh, septum. So this is the septum. So, and then we divide, uh, we develop the tunnel all the way 
uh, from the diverticulum side and also from the esophageal side and then we divide the septum. So strictly speaking, we are not resecting the septum, but diverticulum, but uh, converting a uh, diverticulum into a, a bigger cavity so that the, the food stuff will not be collecting within the diverticulum. I think that's the, that's the total goal or the aim of this D poem. So like that, after the tunnel, we then cut the, the septum. So there is a, a uh, multi-center retrospective study reporting on this, uh, showing that um, the technical success is 90% and the clinical success 100%, and uh, the procedure time is 60 minutes. And uh, of course, uh, we also have the uh, G poem. So uh, I think uh, I don't need to show you this video. Um, this is uh, one of the first report from uh, Morin, uh, Johns Hopkins. So just develop a tunnel all the way to the uh, pyroid muscle for treatment of um, gastroparesis. And then afterwards, uh, performing the myotomy over the uh, pyloric muscle. So from the current systematic review for G poem, Technical success 100%, clinical success is the 82%, and uh, there were actually minimal adverse events as well. So how about the trend of development of endoscopy in the next 10 years? I think uh, previous, uh, I think uh, previous speaker already illustrated to us some of the future for diagnostic endoscopy, and uh, the trend, of course, is towards a, a more uh, AI de detection. Uh, early detection of GI uh, lesions and uh, with the early detection of the GI lesion we have a much higher uh, 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 search towards an increased potential for therapeutic endoscopy because we are detecting more early lesions. So I think it will be back from the first base back to second or even the first base. So uh, the uh, increasing potential for therapeutic endoscopy will be placed uh, some or even most of the surgical procedure I can predict because the disease will diagnose at the early stage and you do not need to resect the organ in order to treat the disease. So I guess we will see a much more higher potential in the therapeutic endoscopy. Then we need uh, f three pillar of development. Firstly is the procedure. So we need to develop more endoluminal procedure. For example, I can propose properly and uh, predict full fingers resection is one of the major, major procedure. And uh, also GI and stomosis, anti-reflux procedure, bariatrics will all be done by endoscopy. For the platform design, we need a better image guided endoscopy or even the external forces like magnetic multitasking uh, platforms or robotics application and the innovative instruments designed for tissue resection and approximation. So uh, just uh, previously, um, I presented uh, the POET or the STIR, but uh, during the procedure, I always have a question that I worry I may have breached the capsule surrounding the GIST tumor, and that may cause a local recurrence because uh, the dissection is really, really close to the tumor. So I always worry that I may breach uh, the tumor capsule. So in order to have improvement in this dissection, I think uh, probably uh, full fitness resection is the, is the solution. So uh, full fitness resection has been applied in, for treatment of uh, mucosal neoplasia with uh, dense submucosal fibrosis or submucosal tumor. So this TEO device is actually one of the very first device uh, that can achieve a full fitness resection in the rectum. It's been applied in the 1990s during the development of laparoscopic surgery for treatment of uh, rectal, uh, early rectal cancer. So um, this is uh, one of the video I have um, been the, applying the full fitness resection for treatment of uh, gastric uh, gist. So here you can see this is the uh, gist tumor at the cardia. So first I would uh, open up the uh, mucosa over the distal part of this uh, mucosal tumor. Uh, only half of the circumference is needed uh, for opening up. And then afterwards, I will dissect uh, the tumor at the base uh, from the muscularis layer, uh, trying to expose the two sides of the tumor. So uh, as I mentioned, we plan to have a full fitness resection. So definitely we will see the muscularis probe here and dissect over there. and. Uh, 
at this juncture, I always, uh, as I mentioned, worry about uh, breaching the tumor capsule. So I leave some of the muscle uh, margin uh, to the tumor, and uh, eventually it would end up in a um, full fingers uh, incision. And uh, to endoscopies, it would be a perforation. But I try to minimize uh, the um, the uh, perforation and also um, to wait until the very moment that is necessary so that uh, we can uh, perform most of the mobilization surrounding the tumor. So generally, I use uh, both the uh, the dew knife and also the um, IT knife. So when I expose the tumor to the peritoneal cavity, then I would like to um, apply a, a clip and uh, suture or the line technique so that I can retrieve the tumor to the inner uh, lumen of the stomach. So that has a uh, surface advantage. Firstly, is that uh, I'll be able to retract uh, the tumor so that it will not drop into the peritoneal cavity. That would be disastrous for a flexible endoscopy. So secondly, is that uh, I believe flexible endoscopy, the best uh, uh, area to work on is still intraluminal not not to the nooks, not outside the lumen. So if we can pull the tumor back into the lumen, then we can perform any kind of dissection. So these two uh, clip and the suture help us to pull the uh, tumor all the way back into the gastric lumen, as you can see here. So now I can see most of the tumor, and then I can uh, observe the tumor border and the margin over the serosal side. So uh, later on, you'll be able to see. So right now, it's still dissecting around the tumor. And then now you can see this is a gastric cirrhosal side outside. But you can see clearly the tumor margin at the tumor border. And then afterwards, I will just cut open the uh, cirrhosal. And then the, I can perform the uh, complete uh, the dissection using the uh, IT knife. OK. So probably to fast forward a little bit. So I complete the tumor dissection with the uh, IT knife. So and then afterwards, after this uh, completely dissect uh, tumor, I first retrieve the tumor because I worry that it will drop down into the peritoneal cavity. And uh, we have got this defect. And uh, then I'll close it by the uh, Apollo overstitch. So just like that. So closing the uh, two sides, suturing with um, figure of eight manner, and then tighten the suture by a casing, so like that. Okay, and then tighten up, and that would uh, usually it takes around two to three suture to close the defect. This is the final step. So I think uh, there are a few methods of closing the defect uh, for full fingers resection. One is the clip and the uh, the other is uh, using the suturing uh, technique. And uh, now we have the uh, Apollo physics with a double channel and also with a single channel. OK, so I probably will skip that. So I think uh, the other important development in the future is probably to uh, redefine or redevelop our platform of endoscope because uh, it's been improving over the imaging side, but uh, he's not been improving uh, at all for the therapeutic side. So uh, for surgeon, we always operated with uh, two hands uh, and uh, with the current robotic system, as you can see, we'll be able to um, perform a very precise uh, dissection. So uh, probably the same concept should be applied um, to the uh, therapeutic endoscopy. So uh, we have uh, develop uh, this master robot. Uh, it's been uh, a collaboration between uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. So um, the engineer developed the, this is Professor Louis V, and uh, also uh, co collaboration with uh, Lawrence Ho from National University of Singapore, and uh, I'm the clinical partner. So uh, we 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 actually uh, applied this uh, very first uh, prototype of the Endomaster to perform the gastric ESD. Uh, so this is the concept. We have, um, this is already nine years ago. So this is the very first prototype of the uh, robotic endoscope. So one arm will be able to uh, uh, achieve a good tissue retraction, while the other arm is for the dissection. So um, the two arms are not interchangeable. 
and uh, we, it's only building on a uh, double channel endoscope but uh, with this concept this is uh, quite different from the usual ESD so the uh, endoscope is uh, holding the endoscope while the surgeon is uh, sitting on the away from the patient so you can see that uh, we can uh, lift up uh, the mucosa and perform the uh, some mucosal dissection like that okay so uh, we have reported uh, this uh, first uh, robotic ESD in the five patient so three from India two from Hong Kong and uh, this is the current uh, version of this uh, master so uh, it has a independently designed flexible robotic platform and also a built-in endoscopic imaging system with two working channel so this is uh, what we are doing uh, this is an animal study of uh, esophageal ESD so uh, right now we are actually waiting uh, for the clinical trial if if uh, the end COVID didn't happen in Hong Kong, we already probably performed the first case next week. But the problem is uh, because of the end COVID, we need to delay our clinical trial. But uh, this, uh, you can see, we have the similar concept of uh, having a tissue retraction using the one robotic arm and uh, the other arm is for the dissection. And uh, you can see that this is not completely like a surgeon uh, with the minimal invasive approach, but the robotic arm is uh, designed over the uh, 9 o'clock and the 6 o'clock position because this is the most ergonomic and we need to bring down the size of the scope. So the current uh, scope that we have is only 14 mm so that uh, even the colonic ESD can be performed with this platform. So uh, that uh, caused some limitation in terms of uh, uh, the design but uh, this is probably the best that we can have. Okay. So just to fast forward, this is the final part of the dissection and we completed um, this uh, esophageal ESD with the system. So and uh, also in the future, as I mentioned, uh, we probably need some device development. So uh, suturing or the tissue approximation is one of the important area. So this is uh, again a um, development from this uh, system that we will be going to develop uh, suturing and if we have suturing then we can manage GI emergencies, uh, perforation, fistula, uh, we can perform morbid obesity procedure and also do endoscopic full fingers resection. So my final video, so you can see this is uh, the prototype uh, we are still testing in the animal so for the suturing. Uh, so you can see that this is a uh, detachable needle that can pass between the two arms of one of the uh, robotic arm and uh, the other arm is uh, for tissue retraction here so you can see this hole and uh, firstly we can uh, use this uh, left arm to lift up um, the tissue and then the right arm perform the pass the needle in between the, the uh, mucosa and the foot and the uh, muscularis and then we pass the needle again over the other side. And then finally, uh, we can actually use the same system to tie the knot. So with the two arm and uh, tighten the knot. So this is really, really primitive at this moment. We are still improving on the engineering side. So probably in the future, we might be seeing uh, some trial on this system. So in summary, I think uh, some mucosal endoscopy opens a new horizon uh, and that we are developing still a lot of procedure from this uh, first space endoscopy. The safety and efficacy should be confirmed with well-designed clinical trial. While um, the uh, access in the future, I think uh, the uh, first space can also act as an access to extraluminal space but we are treating only adjacent organ disease we are not treating something like uh, appendix from a transgastric approach it's too far away for flexible endoscopy and uh, advanced intervention in first space would be on like implantation of innovative medical devices molecular imaging or even cellular therapy uh, for of uh, functional diseases and uh, the future of endoscopy, I think, in the next decade will be to enhance the diagnostic uh, efficacy and quality in managing high demand and volume of patient screening through new imaging and AI and increasing the therapeutic potential for non-invasive endoscopic uh, surgery. 
So I think uh, we are only limited by our own imagination. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chu. Uh, are there any questions? Professor Ho. Hello. Good. I know that you have done a lot of some mucosal uh, endoscopy resections. Just now you mentioned that 2 cm tunnel length is enough. Some actually say 5 cm because of concern of uh, tunnel breakdown. So your experience is not like that? No, no. We don't have any tunnel breakdown. Actually, uh, most of the uh, submucosal tumor that we resected, the size of the tumor, for example, like 3 cm, the amount of uh, muscular defect is not 3 cm. It must be less because the most of the body of the tumor is not extraluminal, but mostly submucosal. So mm -hmm. maybe three centimeter tumor will end up in like two centimeter of uh, muscul muscular defect. So even a very close mucosal entrance will not breach the uh, muscular defect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I actually have one question. I may be the only one in the room that doesn't know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. It, it strikes me that what you were showing us with the poem is very similar to what paediatric surgeons do um, for uh, pyloric stenosis. Yes. Do you know if there's this has been adapted to that in the neonate? Uh, I haven't heard about... So for pediatric, they are congenital hypertrophic uh, pyloric stenosis. Yes. And the operation is called the Ramstad operation. So uh, it may be too small for an endoscope to pass through, but it's very similar to what GPOM would like mm. to achieve. Uh, that those uh, pediatric patients, they usually develop you know, less in less than one year's age, usually one, one month or two months time, they have this problem. So I don't know whether our endoscope can actually perform such a procedure, but if uh, the endoscope can pass inside, then obviously we can do, we can yeah. do the same G poem. Yeah, it, it just struck me as, as I was watching, and as, as you know, those, those little cuts that they do in a yes. baby end up about this long by the time yes. the, the patient's an adult. So it'd be yes. nice to be able to do it without that cut. Yes. Yeah. All right, well, we might thank Professor Chu for his uh, presentation thank and you. I'll uh, hand over to Raj to wind up. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, Andrew and uh, Charles, and, and thanks, uh, Philip. Uh, that, that, that was uh, fantastic. Uh, also, thank you, Gustavo, for teaching us about uh, computer-aided diagnosis and uh, how to look at math. <laughs> um, I guess uh, we, we're running a bit late, so uh, you know I'd like to thank um, everyone who has uh, come today. Uh, it's it's been fascinating. It's been a long day. I think everybody's quite tired. Uh, particularly, I'd like to thank the the uh, um, the international and national faculty, including the chairs. So Philip Chu, Noria Uedo again, uh, George Ho, uh, Andrew Taylor, and Gregor Brown, who who are on a plane right now. Uh, back to Melbourne. Um, Gustavo, thanks for coming. And uh, of course, uh, Professor Raju, who uh, very kindly uh, uh, provided us with his talk um, a few weeks ago. Also, the interstate chairs, uh, Spiro, who probably was uh, awake at maybe 4 or 5 a.m. today, uh, Bronte in Melbourne, and uh, Ravinda Ogra in Auckland. Uh, we also uh, uh, had uh, a lot of local chairs, uh, Tim Bright, Asif, uh, Charles, Biju, uh, Harsh, Kanhare, Andrew and uh, Charles Koch, um, as well as uh, uh, Jonathan Martin, uh, Gary uh, Hamish yesterday, Devinder Raju, John Shenfine, William Tam, Derek T and Sarah Thompson. So uh, uh, this this meeting was, uh, as I mentioned yesterday morning when we, uh, uh, yesterday afternoon when we were opening the meeting, could not have taken place without two of the Kates, uh, Kate Elliott from Olympus and Kate Illingworth, who uh, um, was from, uh, who is from the University of Adelaide, who helped us with the organizing the security and opening up the uh, sort of auditorium today. Um, so I'd like to thank them. Both of them are not here. And uh, two of our fellows, uh, Kuhn and Flo, uh, as well. 
and uh, the staff from the Lal McEwen Hospital, as usual, uh, you know, they work hard. They were with us up to 8 p.m. yesterday, uh, trying to sort out that problem. Um, and they're here today as well, some of them. So I'd like to thank them. And uh, and Hugh from uh, uh, looking at the AV and IT issues. And thanks, Hugh. I heard the YouTube link was uh, seamless and fantastic. So thank you. Uh, uh, the YouTube link will be on for another 48 hours, so you may be able to access it. Uh, I'll, I'll ask Kate to send you all the link, uh, whoever's interested. And lastly, I think um, you know this would not have been possible without the participants here today. You're still here, at least half of the audience, <laughs> which is great. And uh, people who are in Auckland, Melbourne, and Perth, thank you for coming. Uh, and of course... Uh, people around the Asia Pacific region who's, who've been watching this, uh, I guess, uh, online. So uh, thank you all again, and uh, we hope to see you next year. <laughs>